So I am, admire this man so much. Um, we're honored to have him here today on behalf of all of Eric's club. Welcome, Dave. And now may I present the man with no plan, Dave Smalley. Thank you. You're wonderful. <laughs> Well, it's all downhill from, from now on, so <laughs> that was it. Um, it's really an honor to be here, and I uh, thank uh, many people for having me here, Dean Bowen and Dean Schultz, Dr. Rapole. Um, Claire, thank you so much. Um, you know, Dorothy, you, you guys have done wonderful things. Uh, Greg Rocket for giving me the call to ask me to be here. and. Uh, so um, I'm grateful to be here, and so great to see all such uh, wonderful faces out there. Has anybody ever sat through a lecture uh, from me before? Anybody? Really? What's wrong with you people? Why are you back? <laughs> <laughs> you have evidently nothing to do, or you get extra credit for being here. I'm not too sure. It's my son Maverick. He didn't raise his hand, but uh, he has sat through some of my lectures before. <laughs> Um, not anything about school. Um, he works in our company, runs our music festival division, and um, as, a, as a good Jewish mother would do, he is single, lovely lady, so if you're looking for... <laughs> <laughs> uh, he's, uh, he's sitting next to my lovely wife, Melanie, who is not single, so don't <laughs> anybody get any ideas, so... But, uh, I am honored to be here, and I'm pretty nervous, so I'm going to try to settle down and tell you a few things. Um, Claire mentioned that I came here to the University of Houston to swim. I came from Black Lick, Ohio, town of 300 people. That's yeah, called, right? It's called Black Lick. Uh, you know, uh, I was raised on a farm. We lived on a farm in, in, in exchange for, uh, we took care of the farm in exchange for living there. This is my brother Jim. He can testify to all this stuff. There's people here today that have known me all my life, and so I can't tell any lies because they'll call me out on it right away. But uh, anyhow, I came here to swim and try to figure it all out. Uh, maybe anybody, maybe some of you guys are sitting out there trying to figure it all out right now. Um, that was me. Uh, Claire was right. Is it the reality of this? Is that I came to uh, to school not with a plan. I was in the business college. I was taking a QMS class, it's quantitative management science, I don't know if everybody took it, it has like numbers and letters and powers and stuff and I had no idea what they were talking about. And the problem was is it was taught by someone that had arrived the week uh, in this country, he probably had arrived the week that he started here and I didn't understand what he was saying and <laughs> he didn't know me. I closed my book and, uh, and walked out of class, literally, and I went to the uh, student life building to kind of check it all out to see what my options were. Took this aptitude test and they said I'd be good as a teacher or a fireman or in the hospitality business. Well, that's not a really great option, you know, is it my parents taught and they did they barely squeaked by making a living. I'm scared to death of heights so the fireman thing was out and you know I'd eaten in a restaurant and I had stayed in a hotel, but that was the extent of my hospitality background. And, you know, and the lady that did the test, she could tell that I was pretty distraught because I thought pretty much my life was over. And she said, you know, we do have a hotel school right here on campus. And I was like, okay. And um, she's right. And my roommate and I, we walked over here and I met Dr. Rapole, um, who admitted me, in, admitted me into this school. Um, I had no idea what I was getting into, and it turned out he didn't either, so. <laughs> but he let me in, and, and um, this day I'm very grateful for this, for what this school has uh, shown me, and for Dr. Poe for having the faith in get letting me into this school. Um, Tuesdays and Thursdays, um, right there I took nap, about <laughs> years from, no, right about there, so that was how I did through, got through school. Um, I had a really great time going to college here. You know, I had a lot of fun. I did a lot of things that uh, I'm proud of, and I did a lot more things I'm not proud of. Um, but not for so proud stuff, if they found out about it, it would probably still get me kicked out of school. So we're just gonna focus on the proud stuff, okay? So we're gonna do that. She's right, I graduated from here. It's all American, you know. I got my good grades because of my roommate who 
demanded to study every day for three hours a day. He, quite frankly, wanted to get good grades. It was a little more difficult for him to, to study than it was for me. I was fortunate that way. But every day we went and studied. And I got good grades. It worked out great. And um, from there, you know, we just tried to figure it all out. As students, I think we all have dreams and we all have ambitions and expectations, but how do we turn all that into all these emotions that we have into a reality? And that's what I had to struggle with to get to that particular point. Maybe some of you are there way. Some of you guys might have read the beautifully uh, penned article by Debbie Maurer uh, that she did considering um, what she had to work with. She did a great job and it was called the No Plan Man or something like that, which is partly mostly true. The part of it is, is that I don't have a planned destination. There's no mile markers along the way because I believe that success doesn't have a destination. You can't get there. All you can do is soldier on, stay in the moment, and keep moving forward. And I believe that to be true. If you're not moving forward, you're losing ground, and somebody's going to catch you and pass you. So you guys probably know from what they said that I'm in the catering and concession and event production business. But it's not me in the business, it's, it's us in the business. I can't do much. One person can't do much. We can do a lot. We can do a lot together. And some of my associates are here today, and to keep me honest, but uh, I think right now what I'd like to do is talk more about how to apply what got us to where, we're, where we are going rather than what we did along the way. I think that if I was sitting in your seat, I'd want to know, well, what do I do, okay? Maybe if you're smart, you don't want to be in this business. It's, 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 it's hard, <laughs> you know? And there's some people right there that can tell you just how hard it is. It's hard. <laughs> and um, and those, those are some wonderful people. And, um, you know, so what I'd like to do is just to kind of talk about a little bit about, about that, about, about culture, about corporate culture, and talk about what it means um, for us and where we're trying to go to. Um, a lot of people have to come together to, to make it work. And um, I think that our culture of what we do in our company is, is important. You know, you have to aspire to be a great leader and you have to provide for your team's needs. You know, we have to pre... Your goal, in my opinion, as, as a leader of a company is to provide an atmosphere that will allow people to become self-actualized. There's a, there's a thing called uh, Maslow's Hierarchy of Needs. It sounds really boring, but it's, it's really the truth. You know, you have to, you have to take care of people's their, their basic needs of food, and then you have to take care of safety. And then you've got to build, you know, a thing where they can have, have love, a sense of belonging. And then once they feel all that, okay, that's what this guy says, then they can have self-actualization. They can, they can become what they want to be, and that allows them to be happy. And in a, in a crazy way, that's our goal as business people, is to provide that opportunity for people. I think the culture can be thought of as the DNA of a company. Uh, and it's because it's it really is what breaks down and makes everybody special. What, what works for us is it all starts with something that I think everybody learned in the third grade, and that's the golden rule. Do unto others as you have others do unto you. And I think that that's the core foundation of everything that we do. All the decisions that we make in our company and in our personal life are driven by that, by, by that rule. And I think that once you do that, you know how to treat people you know, because you want, to be, you want to treat people as you want to be treated. We try to apply that to our vendors, how we treat a vendor instead of um, being terse or uh, in causing any issues with them, we try to treat them as we would be treated. And it turns out that it comes back to us and it works. We, we take that foundation of the golden rule and then we build on certain other things that we do. Um, Claire touched on the purpose of our company. It took me 
10 plus years to understand what the purpose of our company being in business was. It wasn't about making money. It, it was about changing the lives of our associates and our clients for the better. And when I understood that, that's when our company really, really took off. If you focus on money, okay, on making money, it is very difficult to have clarity as far as how to, how to make a decision. We employ something called uh, keep your family first, the spectrum way, which is different than having somebody that says keep your family first. Is it because what we're trying to do is not do what's best for our family in the moment, but what's going to be best for our family over the long period of time. Um, we talk about sacrifices, but it's really not sacrifices that we make, they're inconveniences. You know, we might miss, miss some things that go on, but we're providing for a long life for our family to change their lives. We focus on the three main things, okay? And through all the downturns in the economy and the changes and 9-11, et cetera, that we had, if we focus on the three main things, to retain current clients and build new relationships, work as cost-effectively as possible, and deliver the highest quality goods and services in the marketplace, then we've covered our bases as far as what our job is. So we know we have to do those three things, okay? We know we have to take care of our clients, and we put our, fa our family first that way, and then it, it creates a lifestyle for what we're trying to do. And what we do is we start with the little things and pretty much stay there. Because the little things become the big things. You know, we, we have little things that we try to do in our company that try to set us apart from others. And again, it goes back to the golden rule. We send birthday cards with a crisp $5 bill to the children of all of our associates, just like your grandma or somebody might have had. Okay? And one of the reason we do that is that we want the kids to understand that their connection to their mom and dad that work in our company isn't just where mom or dad goes every day. We want them to understand that it's part of a family and part of what we're trying to do. And the kids love to get that, that little card and they love to get that five dollars, you know, and we get lots of nice little thank you notes and crayons and everything else, but uh, it's, it's really something that we do. Valentine's Day, we try to make sure that every female associate gets a red rose. And it's something that I learned from a, a mentor of mine, Alan Becker. And I'm proud to, let, to, to have that tradition carry on. And uh, he's a, he's a, he is a great man, and he did it. And daggone, if it's good enough for him, it's sure good enough for me. We try to award cars and trucks as a reward for great performances in our company. And we allow people to pick out what car or truck that they might want to have. And, and we uh, match our 401 to the highest uh, amount uh, allowed by law. We did away with vacation days, okay, for people of our, in our company that have been in our company for 10 years. Hey, you say, we did away with vacation days. Right. They can have as many vacation days paid as they want, okay? Anybody who's been in our company for 10 years knows when they can take vacation and when they can't. So there's no problem with that. They can take paid vacation as much as they want or as little as they want. And I not have any problem with anybody that ever wants to take a day that it's not appropriate. They know what to do. And then, but allowing them to have that makes a difference. Maverick started something which is now on Thursdays, as Thursday is, is now a random act of kindness day where th that he and his organization do something nice, you know, for um, in, his, in his group, they do it for four people for each, each Thursday. Just little things that we try to do as we go along. I can tell you that it wasn't always this way for me. It didn't, I didn't always have the clarity that I needed to have and understanding. Um, I will, I've not always been a very nice person. In fact, I've been a mean person. But it was like a slow immersion. There was nothing in my life that ever happened that made me understand that I needed to change my life. Okay? It just slowly happened as I, as I grew up. And as I treated people more kindly and thought of people first before I thought of myself, it came to me to 
bring out the theory for me called getting even. Everybody knows about getting even. Maybe you've been on the, on the, on the receiving end or the giving end of getting even. Usually it has a negative connotation. Okay, I'm going to get even with that person for something they did. Okay, well human nature is, is that you do something nice for someone. Okay, they want to get even with you. Okay, they want to be, is it just like being negative? You want to be emotionally balanced. So if you do something nice for someone, you can expect it for the most part to come back to you. If you praise somebody, they're going to get even with you. It's kind of like paying it forward, but it's in a little bit different way. The business, you know, and Claire, the business is a competition, okay? School is a competition. Is it you win or lose out there? And I want to tell you that here at the university, you're competing as, as students as for grades, okay? You're competing for relationships, whether they be personal or professional, okay? And you want to win. And to be able to win, you have to be prepared to win. You have to prepare in all facets to take advantage of opportunities that are going to present themselves as you, as you go along in life. I like to say that the day of the race is not the day to decide to win. And you can take that to the thing, is that you have to prepare to win if you want to win that race. And everybody wants to win, but it's if, it depends if you're prepared. And as I said, when opportunity presents itself, you have to be prepared to take it on. And opportunity doesn't knock just once. There everywhere. There's so many opportunities out there. All we have to do is to be prepared to recognize them and then we have to be prepared to take advantage of them. We ha and then have to find uh, what our objective is for that opportunity. And once we do that, then we can take advantage of it and make it, make it work for us. I hear people talk about a lot of times about um, I, I gave it 110 percent. Okay. There is no 110%, okay? There's just 100%, okay? And I think that a lot of times people say, I took the test, I did the very best I could, okay? I did whatever I could. And that might be true, and you might have given 100%, but did you give it 100% to prepare that way? Did you prepare 100%? And that's the determination of whether or not you gave it 100, 100%. I talk about that and I say it's about me, okay? And we have a, com a thing that says it's all about me. And it sounds pretty self-centered, but it's not about me, it's about M-E, maximum effort, okay? And that's what, that separates between who wins and who loses, okay? There's a lot of different things that come together uh, to, to set those things up. I was... I was struck by Rick, Ricky Oberoi's um, presentation here, um, I guess it was about a year ago, and he mentioned about how factors in his life came together uh, to put him in a, in a position that allowed him to, uh, to, to be successful. He had the circumstances that happened, he put in the hard work and the preparedness that led to his success. And it reminded me of things that I had read in a book called The Outliers. And I don't know if you've ever read that book, but if you have, it's a, it's a wonderful read. Okay? If you haven't and you would like to read it, if you would send me an email, I will send you one of those books because I think it's worthwhile. It talks about case studies um, of great people, near misses, and colossal failures. And, and it talks about how background and things that happen in their lives all kind of come together to allow them to be, you know, on the doorstep of opportunity. And then if they could, oper if they could walk through that door or not. In my life, I've had some interesting things that have come together for me. As I mentioned, I was raised on a farm. We worked sun up to sundown. So from the very early age, I had a work ethic that, that, did, that, that did well for me. I transferred that into competitive swimming where I worked as hard or harder than anybody else. But I watched and I saw that the kids that had great technique okay, were the ones that were the fastest, not necessarily the hardest worker. 
So I learned that I needed to have the best technique and then work the hardest to rise to the top. I was able to come to this college in 1975 when I think that this program was about six years old at that particular time. So getting in on the ground floor of a, a specified, a, spe a specific professional degree and focused allowed me the leg up on the rest of the industry that was learning from their parents or someplace else. Early in my restaurant career when I was working, uh, the general manager and the assistant manager of the place that I was working left the company. I was left alone as the single manager open to close every day okay, for greater than 60 days I did this. Best thing that could ever happen to me. Really hard work Okay? But it gave me a great leg up on anybody that was of my professional age. Okay? I was learning things five times faster than everybody else, which led to promotions, greater pay, those sorts of things, and exposure to other people. So it gave me this fast track of doing things. And then in the early 80s, we started doing catering and other things outside of the building. And I got to do, I was hired by somebody that was coming, Nabisco, that was doing a corporate tent at the Shell Houston Open. I had never done anything with a professional golf tour before. And corporate catering was just kind of starting that way on, on, the, on the golf circuit. This lady came in, her name was Sheila McClanahan. She said, I'm going to give the white glove touch to everything and I want everything perfect. I said, yes ma'am. And she did give the white glove test and we did everything as perfectly as we could. And she was like, great, okay, thank you very much at the end. And it was very terse. She said, by the way, I'd like to hire you to do the tour championship at the end of the year. I go, oh, that's great, thank you very much. Yes, ma'am, we'll do it. We go do that and do the exact same thing, okay? I did not know that the standard of golf at that particular time was more of a picnic style. And we were doing it at high-end catering levels, okay? So every other tournament was coming by and they went, oh, look at that. That's much better than what we have. I want you. Okay, will you come do our tournament? Sure, no problem. I had no idea. I go over here, we're doing the same thing over there. It was great and it set us up to, to, to the point that I was unaware of what we did, but by delivering at the high level, everybody wanted our services. In contrast to that, in 1999, a French lady uh, called us to get a liquor license and she was from Cirque du Soleil. And I had to explain to her that we couldn't lend our, our, our license to you, um, but you know we could work in a particular way. Okay, well I didn't know what Cirque du Soleil was in 1999. And so, but I did know that she needed a caterer. And I thought I might be the man for the job. And so we took off, Melanie and I took off, and we went to all these places to see what Cirque du Soleil was, which is an amazing show, if you've ever seen one, it's just amazing, okay? The hospitality was pedestrian at best. Chafing dishes, little spring rolls, bunch of brown food, plate, pick it up, okay? Nothing, nothing. Well, it didn't make sense. So, we created an, a food experience at Cirque du Soleil that was more in tune with, this, with, with what the show was about. Estelle can tell you that we went through tasting after tasting and tasting. But when we had it, we had it right. We invented all kinds of things never seen before. We brought them all out for a tasting. They walked in, their jaws dropped. And oh my God, this is exactly what we should be doing. They were embarrassed that they weren't doing it. Can you do this at other places? Yes, ma'am, we sure can. And away we went. 15 years later, I can't even tell you how much business that we've done with them. They're great partners. But the idea is that all these random occurrences helped me to prepare myself to be aware of what was going on. Oftentimes I was in the right place at the right time, but in order to take full advantage of those opportunities, we had to have a prepared staff and ready to go. If your heart is pure and your motivations are pure, you'll be able to take, care, take advantage of all the opportunities. If you're focused on money, if you are immoral, okay, if you have an agenda that doesn't meet okay, with yourself, you will not recognize those opportunities. In the end, you will fail.
I can guarantee it. I've seen lots of people fly high for a short period of time and come crashing down because they had no foundation and they had no gut to, to and no and no and no way to drive themselves. I guess I come back to the no plan plan. Okay? The only thing I've planned to do is to win. I don't have an end game and I think that's okay. You know? But I want to tell you that life just doesn't throw you fastballs down the middle. There's a lot of curveballs that come at you. Some personal, some professional, but your destiny is oftentimes decided more of how you handle adversity than how you handle success. Everybody's your friend when you're on top, and your true friends are there when you need them. Adversity is a great teacher, and I've had my share of challenges. You know, I think about people that have had real challenges. I think about service people, those people that have been, that make sacrifices and things that go through and people that what they have to face in their life and so then I think well maybe I really haven't faced adversity and I know that I certainly haven't faced it on that level of having people shooting at me or wanting me to be be killed but I've been challenged in 2003 our warehouse burned to the ground everything we had was lost everything several million dollars of gear only a fraction of it was insured but it was a great day. Because what I learned is that nothing could stop us. Nothing. Our people went to Home Depot to build the things that we needed to build to get a golf tournament out. This was on a Wednesday, on a Friday. It had to leave. Okay? They went there, they got generators, and started building it. The fire trucks are there at our place. The place is still burning. And they're out in the front building this stuff. Our catering people went from, to different locations that we had, went and bought food, did everything, redid the caterings and took it out. It was amazing. They worked 24 hours a day outside, never stopped, pouring rain. It's the, the truth, it was the pouring rain. Not a tent on them and running those electric saws and getting all that stuff built and daggone it, that stuff went into the trucks and away it went. I didn't ask them to do any of that. They just did it. I'm going to tell you something else. I've never told a group of people, and I'm going to try to be short. In the early 80s, I had a restaurant called Dave's. And it was opened by myself and two developers, the real estate developers. And what they, it was in, in the time we could go and you get a 110% loan. Okay, and I got, we opened this place up and I was 25 years old. Okay, way too young to be doing this, but that's another story. But in the end, okay, these two developers went chapter 11, chapter 7 when things went in the downturn. In the interim, they had sold their stock in the restaurant to their wives or transferred it. Okay, so these guys went chapter 7, okay. So they have no liability on the note at the restaurant. Only one person does, me, okay? Those people took their stock and sold it to a restaurant tour. He came in and said, guess what? You're fired, you're gone. And I had to do some quick thinking because what this person was going to do is he was going to just run the place down. He had no liability. I was on every note, okay? He was gonna run it down, take the money, and be done. Some fast talking, I proved my worth. He gave me a chance, cut my salary to $2,000 a month. I rode my bike to work, and I made it work. Settled, went to the FDIC, it's Dan Hauser here. He is a, he takes care of Wood Forest Bank. He's a cougar, and uh, and he can tell you that this is all the facts. Is that we settled with the FDIC. I paid it out, and when I paid it out, I got to end that partnership, which wasn't a partnership at all. I was not a partner in it. Um, I was asked to do some terrible things, 
that I had to do, and I will tell you that there was many nights that I cried myself to sleep, to be quite honest, honest with you, because I, did, I knew that where I was wasn't a, wasn't a good place. But I survived, made me better, made me never want to treat people badly, never want to see anything like that. But we all face challenges. We just have to look within ourselves to find out if we're up to that challenge. It's sort of like being prepared to win. We have to know ourselves and make, and make sure that we are up to those challenges. In my personal life, I've been faced with life or death situations on three occasions, none of which involved me or anyone that I know. Three times I've come upon an instance where if I didn't do something, somebody was going to die. In all three instances, my first reaction was to run and to not be a part of that. A little embarrassing to say that, but it's true. Um, all three times, I got over that and, um, and went pushed into action. But there's one time I want to tell you about because I think that's something you can find out about yourself. I was in Steamboat Springs, Colorado skiing and um, I was driving, I had to go mail a letter. And it, during this particular time, uh, I saw some smoke coming from a building that wasn't supposed to come from that building. And I looked and I looked a little bit closer and there was glass all over the sidewalk where the windows had blown out. Not good. So I drove around. I, walk, I went to this office building and I went and I, and I, call, I went in, there was nobody in there. I called 911, they said they'd be there right away. I went back outside. As I'm going back out in the alley, I could see some flames coming from this building. There was a restaurant and people hollering for help. Okay, I ran to the door, the door is jammed. What had happened was that there was uh, an uh, underground gas line explosion and the concussion from the explosion had broken everybody's in there their ankles and legs and they couldn't get out and the door was jammed. So I ran over to this car because I see some skis on this car and as I'm grabbing, getting rid of the skis, this mountain man, he was six, eight, huge, giant guy, grabs those skis, okay? And we go over there, okay, and pound that door open. And he runs in there and he grabs this person and brings him to me. I take him, I put him out here on the street Okay, and we did that and we copied that and we, and we repeated that thing three times till we got all four people out of that building. At that time, the, the paramedics and the fire people show up. Okay, and they're like, okay, great, good. We tell them what's going on, they give those people. And they said, what happened? I'm trying to tell the guy what happened. And I was, as I looked to show, look for the mountain man, he had disappeared. And I'm telling these people about this mountain man that, that pulled these people out. And everybody looked at me strangely. He, nobody else saw him. I was the only one that saw him. Um, inside me, there was a mountain man. And when I needed him, he was there. And it took a long time to to figure that out. But while it was pretty emotional and still is, I can see everything very vividly today. I know that inside me, there's that mountain man. And I think there's inside every one of us is a mountain man that when we need that, we can call on it. If we believe in ourselves, and I tell you, is that I've never seen that man come out again, but I know that if I'm in that situation, I got that. I can call upon that person. Leadership comes from inspiring people. People talk about motivating people. Okay? It's about inspiring people. To motivate is, it, is something you do to a person. To inspire some, someone is to, is to give them spirit. The definition is just different. It's to breathe in, to infuse, and to encourage influence with the divine influence on somebody. So would you rather have something done to you, or would you rather have something within you 
Okay? I want to be inspired, not motivated. So I think that you can take that to the bank and know that as you go through things, to inspire someone is the way that you can reach someone and get what you need out of them. I hope I've given you a couple of lessons that you can maybe p call upon as you go through your personal lives. I think it, I, I think it made more sense to me to, if I were sitting in your, in your chair today, I'd rather know about those things than how many hot dogs some guy sold or how many beers that do we do. We've got a, a great company. I'm honored to work with some of these people here that are here today. They surprised me by showing up. Okay, they keep me honest, and uh, and it's really great to to be here. And Dorothy, that's all I got. <laughs> Thank you. That was wonderful. That was, that was a, that, I mean, it was a great personal story. Don't go anywhere. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for sharing that with us. Um, I think that's the kind of thing that really is important for the students to know and understand that that's why we have come back and done this series so that um, you realize that it's overcoming the adversities and recognizing the opportunities. It happens to all of us, no matter what. Um, Dave, I want to thank you very much for um, being our latest distinguished alumni lecture thank you and um, I, we're going to take a few moments we've, we've got time for some questions um, again after the uh, after we finish here we will be in the hall of honor our um, other lectures will be there as well as we have some other um, Jeremy Vladis is here and uh, Jonathan Shear and Marcia Handler was there any of the other other Eric's club members that I didn't get. Okay, they will also be with us in uh, the Hall of Honor. Does anybody have any questions they want to ask right now? No, everybody wants to get. Go ahead. Yeah, no, no, no. Oh, go ahead. So you started off small. So do you have like different locations, like all nationwide kind of thing? Yes, ma'am. Um, we do. We uh, go across the United States. We have offices in many different cities. Um, I will tell you that uh, these nice people right here uh, have interned with us before. We do paid interns. If you want to get crazy and, and see the world in a, from a whole different perspective, you know, it'll make a lot of the things great. We'd love to, to uh, talk to you about those kind of things. But yeah, we're, we're Houston based, but we're, we have a, a, a pretty much of a North American reach. Um, yes, ma'am. Thank you. Um, we, we don't have sales per se. We do things by referral and targeted, uh, you know, is it targeted message. We took uh, our company Spectrum and we rebranded our local catering, uh, Wicked Whisk, because if people use the internet these days, and if you go to Spectrum and you want to have a corporate event or a wedding or something like that, you look up Spectrum and you go, well, why do I want to have somebody here that does uh, you know, uh, you know, crazy events. Uh, you know, out and you know, go to Bonnaroo and stuff like that. You know, is it, it doesn't make there's not a connection. So we rebranded that. So we do some sales, but they're targeted sales on that. But the rest of it, Melanie takes care of as far as is uh, we take referrals, and that's how we built our business. For the first year and a half, I was in business. Our um, as Spectrum, um, our phone number was unlisted. <laughs> True story, true story. Okay, by design? it was, oh. it was, and here and here's why. Is it when I started the company? Is it we were, I was obviously small, and didn't have the resources to begin doing all kinds of uh, re, you know responses, etc. So when somebody called me, I knew that they wanted to do business, and I wasn't putting a bid in, and so it would be. And then it got to the point where it came, then it kind of, kind of became a cool thing where people go, you know, you know what I had to go through to get your number? And then they go, oh, I've got his number. You can call this number. But then it became, a, a, at one point, when it, it, 
it, I realized that it was becoming a, an inconvenience to some of the people that we worked for, that that's when we changed it and got it listed. Kind of weird. Yes, sir. So, toughest time of your life, you felt like giving up, what made you keep going? I don't think giving up's an option. You know, is it? You know, there were, like I said, there were times I cried myself to sleep. You know, but is it? You just get up the next day and you just know that you got to get there. You know, you just go. You just, you just go. You know. Now it's easy. For me, you know, I know, I know that we've got 500 people in our company that count on me to be a good leader. And if I fail them, I fail them and I fail their families, okay? I like to win, but I hate to lose worse, okay? Yes, ma'am. Is it easier for you to have a family life because your wife doesn't do business with you? I want you put, like I said before, we do, you put family first the spectrum way. Um, Maverick will tell you there was times that I, that I couldn't be there. There was times I drove all night to be at a, at a function of his, you know, but you do what you have to do in order to get yourself to the, so that you can, you can have, have, have a great family life in the long term. Yes, ma'am. Couldn't think of anything else. <laughs> True story is is that uh, actually is that I was t when when I the, the day that we started the company was February tenth, nineteen ninety two, and I called my friend Joe Pogi, and he's the one that gave me the idea. Truthfully, it was on a telephone call. He's a brilliant guy, you know. Uh, Morgan, as it I went to I went to college here with with uh, with Morgan's dad, uh, Paul who is also a, an extraordinary person. But you'll find there's a thread of all the people that you go to school with here, okay? You have, you have bonds with these people that will last your whole life, okay? And there's, if there's one objective that I would like to see our organization as, as, a, as, as the, ho the Hilton Hotel take on is to make sure that we get the, the, the word out to everybody that's been here what we do for a living so that we can do business with each other. We should do business with each other first, okay? Not ask for freebies and not do this, but we should do business with each other, support each other. And there's this huge range of people that we can do. We can go to, we can stay in their hotels, we can hire their restaurants, you know, we can do all sorts of things, you know. You can have a financial advisor. This guy, this guy knows about money, okay? He went here. He, he, looks over, he looks after like $147 of my money, maybe more. I guess the, the market's run up. I think it's like a, $149 now, I think. So yeah, if you've got 20 bucks, call him up. He'll, he'll invest it for you. That's great. No, I'm serious. Steve is a financial advisor. Do business with people you know, okay? You had that bond. They'll look out for you and you look out for them. Steve just unlisted his number. <laughs> <laughs> He's got enough money. <laughs> okay. Okay, well, we'll have more questions uh, in Hall of Honor. We have one last okay. thing to okay. do that uh, it's a tradition when um, you fulfill the requirements of um, doing a distinguished lecture, which is funded by the Eric Hilton Distinguished Chair. You then receive your own chair. chair. Eric Hilton Distinguished Lecture Chair. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. You're a wonderful Thank person. You. Thank, Thank you. you for your support. Oh, my pleasure. Okay, sorry. <laughs> yeah. He's been my teacher for a long time. <laughs> Can I get up now? Yes. Okay, good. I, I think that's it. Thank that's you all for being here.